Good day, listeners. Welcome to this edition of the Pure Sex Radio broadcast. We're glad to have you with us. My name is Jonathan, and we have back with us a very special guest and friend. We've got Dr. Julie Slattery. So, Julie, and welcome to the program. Thanks for having me back. I feel like you're always on my show, and I get to be on your show, so that's pretty fun. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's actually been a little while since we've actually had you on, on our program, and I think that's because uh, you guys at Authentic Intimacy have been really hard at work over the last year and a half uh, on something that we are going to be talking about today um, that I'm really excited about. And I know you're super excited about too, because um, this, this idea of sexual discipleship, you know, these two words that you've put together that, that at first sometimes seem like, are those words that can go together? I know God started laying this on your heart some years ago, um, out of your work that you've been doing at Authentic NMC to be able to help women understand their design as, as females and what it means to be a sexual being. And then God started working on you in this area of, well, man, there's a, there's a larger message here. So can you give us a little bit of the backstory on how you came to this intersection of sexuality and discipleship? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, I, we've been doing AI for, I think it's eight years now. And along that journey, I feel like God just teaches me new things and unfolds kind of deeper truths of what we're doing. And so probably at about year three or four, as I was doing all this work with Christian women, really around the country and even in other countries, one of the things that I noticed was that for a lot of women, sexuality felt like a disconnect from their relationship with God. And so even women that knew the scriptures were faithful in Bible study, faithful in church community, when it came to the application of that to their sexuality or even to sexual questions that the culture is facing, they, they almost felt like a deer in the headlight of, well, I don't know how to apply this. And the more I thought about that, the more this concept came to me that most Christians have been sexually discipled by the world. Uh, and the distinction is that at church, we learn what to think about certain sexual issues, like uh, wrong to have sex before marriage. Um, is gay marriage wrong? How about pornography? We're, we talk about the list of do's and don'ts, but the world has trained us how to think about sex, um, like how to reason and why it's important. And so this concept started to just be intriguing to me of basically at Authentic Intimacy, what we've been doing is we've been sexually discipling women in their sexuality, not just telling them what to think, but really teaching them how to think biblically about um, why God created sex and how that applies really to every stage of life. So that's sort of the backdrop. And then we've, we've kind of gone from there. <laughs> yeah. And I want to, I want to keep maybe, uh, unpacking just that idea of discipleship because, you know, it's, it's our, uh, it's our mandate from our Lord, right? Jesus said, this is your job is to make disciples, you know? Um, and there is a, there's a training element there. I mean, he said to teach them to obey everything that I've commanded to you, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's this, there's this mandate that we are to make disciples. I think sometimes, like you said, we have relegated that to the realm of education. Right. So, so we think we're being discipled or we're discipling others when we simply give them the quote unquote correct information from a biblical framework, right? Yeah. But help us understand when you talk about the difference between like what to think versus how to think, what's the bridge there? Because I think sometimes people... I mean, I know that for me, for the longest time, I sort of had a disconnect when somebody would try to describe to me what you're saying is discipleship because I thought, well, wait a second, I've been, I've been memorizing scripture and I've been going to church and I've been, I've been praying and, and I, you know, I, I have my quiet time every day. Isn't that like, am I not a disciple of Jesus? Mm -hmm. So can you, because, so I think a lot of people understand what it is to be in that camp of the, the what like mm -hmm. what, where are the lines? What is true? What is false? But really struggle to know how, what's the bridge that crosses over into more of how I actually think and, and more than that, how I actually connect to this following of Jesus. 
Yeah, a really good question. Um, you know, let me start with even just something that Jesus said. He talked about how our words are the overflow of our heart. And he said, what really is wrong with you is not what you're putting in your body, but what's coming out of your body, it's coming out of your heart. And uh, I think a lot of approaches to sexuality within the church are about trying to change behaviors and trying to get rid of symptoms rather than going to the heart level of what do I really believe about sexuality? And have I surrendered this area of my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? And that's a very different line of questioning than just how do I stop looking at pornography? And so for example, uh, you know, the average Christian married couple will be asking questions like, what do we do if we disagree on how often to have sex? Uh, or what if I'm not satisfied in our sexual relationship? That's a very symptom related question. And I can answer those questions like tactically, like, well, maybe if you compromise or communicate, but really you're not discipling people when you give them those kind of just practical skills without prompting them to ask the deeper questions of what do you think the purpose of sex and marriage is? And what would it look like to surrender this aspect of your marriage again to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? So let's start with the deeper issues of what we're believing, uh, what our heart is aligned with. Is it aligned to my desires or is it aligned to the will of Jesus Christ? And let's start at that level, and then we can build the practical out of that deeper level of thinking and surrender. And when Jesus talked about discipleship, he didn't talk about behaviors. He talked about the posture of our heart. Uh, and so discipleship is much deeper in terms of looking at why we believe what we believe. And again, what is the posture of my heart towards the Lord in this area of my life? Yeah, and one of the things that, that comes to my mind as you're saying that is, is I do want to make it clear that we, you know, discipleship is not disconnected from information. <laughs> I mean, no. there is doctrine that's part of this. It kind of makes me think, though, of of uh, the book of Ephesians, where the Apostle Paul establishes in the first three chapters, without a single command given to us, a sense of theology of understanding our identity and what it means to be a child of God and and how that relationship is formed through faith by grace and and what that means to our relationship with ourselves and to one another and then gets to the practical applications of that in the last three chapters of the book and i think that's a little bit of what you're talking about sometimes we try to flip those around maybe where we say yeah. well give me all the practical and then i'll probably yeah. figure out what the base is of this and it's like no you need the base first in order for these practical applications of truth to start to flow out of your life rather than I'm going to do this mechanical thing of behavior change and somehow then my heart will probably change as a result yes. of that. Yeah. And so, so can yeah. you talk a little bit about that order and, sure. and what you've maybe even seen in ministry of how people struggle to engage with this idea of sexual discipleship because they may have that order out of whack? Yeah, I think actually the order probably is we try we try to fix the level of behavior first. And then we get to the point where we feel like Paul said in Romans chapter seven, you know, I'm doing what I don't want to do. And mm. the very things that I'm trying to do walk with integrity. I can't, I can't do, I can't change my heart towards my spouse. I can't stop feeling the shame and guilt. I can't get the temptations to go away. Uh, and that's what breaks us to say, maybe there's a deeper level of surrender. And I think if we don't try and fail first, we usually aren't at the place where we're willing to just say, I'm broken. And this is this overlaps with your experience, Jonathan, as a Christian man trying in your, your own strength to change behavior. It took failure for you to get to the place where you're like, I'm, I'm done. I got no more strategies. God, either you're going to rescue me or I'm not going to make it. And uh, I think it takes all of us to that level where we start to realize God wants to do something deeper in my life than just clean up my behavior. Uh, he really is after the surrender. Um, and I think a lot of Christians never get there. They just get frustrated with uh, the behavior change. They either give up or they become legalistic um, with themselves and with other people. And I think that's why a lot of the conversations in Christian communities around sexuality have either been silenced or they come across as um, rule-based. Uh, 
uh, mm -hmm. and, and legalistic because we haven't given an alternative. We haven't applied these really important principles of discipleship and heart change to the issue of sexuality. Um, and so when I talk about this at first, uh, as you've been saying, people are a little bit put, put back like, what does that mean? That sounds kind of weird. What does that look like? Because we've only understood sexuality in the context of education. Now, like if I say sex education, you all know what that means. But when I say sexual discipleship, you're like, wow, like that's weird. I've never thought about that. Um, but once you understand what that means and the hope that it brings, that Jesus Christ actually can walk with me in the midst of whatever brokenness, whatever challenge I'm facing, and he can equip me, then there's a sense of hope and really the possibility of freedom that I think a lot of people don't know that's there. Yeah. So what is, so uh, as you put these words together, I mean, I think we're, we're talking about it. We're talking about discipleship, but then, then let's talk about sexual, the sexual component, sexuality. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of confusion around what it means to be a sexual being right in our yeah. culture today. I mean, yeah. can you help us understand just a, a basic framework of when somebody's coming to this issue and saying, you know, this, I'm kind of curious about this sexual discipleship stuff. I got a lot of baggage in my history. It could be anything, right? It could be addiction. Mm -hmm. It could be abuse. It could be trauma. It could be just confusion. Um, where do you start, start a person to engage this understanding of sexual discipleship? Because while we're, while we are trying to make a distinction, right, between what to think and how to think there's, and, and also a distinction between uh, behavior and the, the motives of the heart behind the behavior, these things are not disconnected from each other, right? In mm -hmm. other words, it's not like saying, oh, your, your heart and your motives are completely disembodied from you. It's like, no, they're connected within your body. <laughs> Yes. So there's behavioral components that are part of this. But if you were going to have a person say, Julie, I'm totally curious about sexual discipleship. Where do I start? Yeah. You know, yeah. what would you say to somebody? Well, kind of the way that the model that, that I've developed out of this is, this is broken into three parts. The first one is knowing what we believe. The second is living what we believe. And the third is passing on what we believe. And I think most of us want to start with either one, either two or three. We either want our behavior to change, okay, help me to walk with sexual integrity, or we even want to start at three. Um, help me share with my son or daughter or neighbor God's design for sex. But we skip totally that first question of knowing what we believe about sex and sexuality. And I think the reason we skip it is because we've been through the sermons. We might have read a book. We think we know the basics of biblical sexuality, but what I found even in my own journey was even though I had written books on sexuality, there were a lot of aspects of biblical sexuality that I really didn't know. And uh, the way that I teach this is by talking about what is your sexual narrative. Mm -hmm. And your sexual narrative is really the backstory of how you understand the purpose of sexuality how that integrates with who you are as a spiritual being, as a physical being. And there's a couple of prominent narratives that, mo that have really impacted our thinking that we, we're not even aware that this is the backdrop of how we're thinking through these issues. Um, so like one of them is just the predominant cultural narrative of sexuality, which says your sexuality is all about your identity. It's about your personal expression. And for you to be a happy, mature adult, you need to discover what you need sexually. You need to experiment. If you're in an unhappy marriage and you're not sexually fulfilled, then that's gonna, that's gonna hurt you. And so you need to get out of that marriage. Um, and so that cultural narrative, you can see it playing out so much in movies and television shows in school curriculum uh, that are, is basically saying, if you want people to be happy and healthy, remove restraint and let them be who they fundamentally believe they are sexually. Um, so that's the prominent narrative. And then the traditional church narrative, I think also has played a lot into our thinking, which is, uh, it has some truth in it, but it's simplistic. It basically says sexuality is important because it's this really key part of honoring God. And if you disobey God sexually, you're kind of a second class citizen in the kingdom of God. Like he can forgive you, 
but sexual sin is unlike any other sin. It brings the shame. And the whole goal is to avoid immorality. The whole goal is to stay pure until you get married, not cheat on your spouse. Uh, and I think that's what most of us heard about sex from Christian resources growing up, which have, has given us, again, a legalistic, very mm -hmm. limited view of why sexuality matters. So, uh, Jonathan, you've heard me teach on this many, many times, but I, I really think there's a third biblical narrative. There's a third narrative that God would want to push us into that totally changes the paradigms of how we view every sexual issue. And so that's really the first place to start is to dive into what does the scripture really say about sex? Not just what we're not supposed to do or what we're supposed to do, but why does God even care about this part of our humanity? Why is it so sacred? And so that's where we begin with sexual discipleship. And I think it's so good to, to help people, uh, have a starting point of knowing like where are they within those narratives yes. uh, because you know one of the things that we we talk about in our ministry all the time is you know you can't get to where you want to go if you don't know where you're starting from yeah. so when we like in our workshops when we're talking about guys that man they've got a bunch of sexual addiction or pornography addiction they're coming from all this brokenness and they're coming and they're saying you know what i just want to get away from all of this pain away from all this stuff i just want to be over over here where life is you know, where there's a sense of peace and purity and integrity and all that. And we say, well, um, how do you think you're going to get there? How do you think you're going to navigate a path there if you don't have a real solid understanding of where you're starting from? You mm -hmm. might as well just throw a dart in the dark, you know, and that's the painful part, I think, of this process, right? Is there's an aspect of which we've got to pull back the, the curtain, so to speak, and pull off the masks and say, I need to, I need to take an honest look at myself. What have I been believing about my design as a man or a woman? What have I been believing about um, sexuality, identity? Uh, and for, for many of us, well, for all of us, we're going to start from a place of brokenness. Right. Because none of us have managed any part of our lives perfectly. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think it's important too then to that we we let people know that when we're inviting them into this process of sexual discipleship this must be a grace-based environment right. right because yeah. like you said I mean even with a lot of the the simplistic sort of purity narrative or or you know the simplistic the the legalistic aspect of of sexuality it's such a shame-based um paradigm a lot of times, right? Because mm -hmm. it's saying, well, guess what? If you don't fit in this very narrow picture, if you've ever stepped outside of that, then, you know, shame on you. Right. And it's very hard to want to step back into like a church environment or step back into uh, even a biblical framework if you're carrying all that shame. So can you just say a word to the folks out there who's saying, man, I, I don't know where I fit on the spectrum, but I am carrying a lot of hurt. I'm carrying a lot of stuff that I don't know if I can share with anybody. What would you say to that person to say that there's, there's hope, there's good news on this journey of sexual discipleship? Yeah. You know, one of the, the key principles that I've learned along the way of really building this out is this statement that we are all sexually broken. And it kind of refers back to what you said with the traditional church narrative. Not only does it create the shame but it also creates pride because it kind of divides us into two categories. There's the people that have a problem and are openly involved in sexual immorality. And then there are people that aren't. And um, all of us who are listening right now, we can identify with one of those two categories. Uh, even if you've been through sexual sin and you're on the other side of that, you can start to develop an attitude of, well, I don't do that anymore. Or let's say uh, you're the spouse of somebody who has been involved in sexual sin, you can feel like, well, he's the one that broke the marriage. He's the one with the problem. And that's so inconsistent with the larger message of what the gospel says and what we believe in what Jesus taught. His harshest words were for the people who thought things like, well, I don't struggle with that kind of sin. Like I'm okay with God. And so what I'd say to that person that's really hurting and feeling ashamed is that 
actually that's the place that God finds us all in when we're honest. Uh, we all have to say, my heart is deceitful. My heart has wickedness in it. Uh, it manifests itself in different ways, depending on circumstances and personality and where I am in terms of maturity. But the ground is level at the cross. Mm -hmm. And what I love about what you do, Jonathan, at your ministry is creating environments where we're all going to start at that place of, I need the Lord. I need his grace. I need his redemption. I need his truth. Uh, and finding communities like that, that aren't falling into that trap of, well, I'm the helper and you're the one who needs help. Uh, I'm the whole one. You're the broken one. We all are broken and not only a little bit broken, we're all helpless uh, without the power of Jesus Christ in our lives and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so that is bad news because it means I can't fix myself, but it's also great news because it means that I'm just like everyone else and mm -hmm. the Lord has offered his help and not only his help, his redemption. And, um, and you and I have been privileged to see life after life after life uh, that is truly surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ be made new, completely made new. And, uh, and so this is, there is hope. Uh, there's hope for anyone. No one, none of us are too far gone for the Lord to reach us and to save us. Yeah. And one of the things we like to say around here is no matter where any of us are on this journey, we're, we're more alike than we are different. Yeah. If we're just willing to tell each other our stories, you know, right. and I think that's another part of this sexual discipleship piece, right? Is, I mean, you've got to, you've got to have the safety and the freedom to be able to unpack your story because in order for us to know where our beliefs fall within those narratives, that's connected to our story. That's a narrative, right? I mean, our story is our narrative. Um, so you guys have been hard at work, not just um, teaching on this in your conferences, but now you've sort of coalesced and put together some materials and a platform for people to be able to get much more uh, invested into this process, not only for themselves, but also then to be able, like you said, to eventually share what we believe about God's design for sexuality. So can you talk a little bit about uh, the Sexual Discipleship website and some of the tools and resources that are available there for helping people to engage this process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our primary website has been authenticintimacy.com. And if you go to that website, you're going to find help and just content on specific issues related to sexuality. A lot of our content is geared towards women, but we've learned that a lot of men are, are engaging with us as well, which is really fun. Um, but as I started teaching more on this concept of sexual discipleship, there were a lot of uh, people who, who would say, I'm a pastor, I'm a counselor, I'm a lay leader, I'm a parent, and I want to learn this in order to disciple other people. And so uh, we eventually end up building and just, just within the last few weeks, launching the website sexualdiscipleship.com, which has a similar but a different mission from authenticintimacy.com. At authenticintimacy.com, we're discipling. At sexualdiscipleship.com, we're teaching you how to disciple. Uh, and there are resources there like uh, an e-course that kind of walks you through the basics of what is sexual discipleship. Um, how do I get this in my own life first and then be equipped to help others? We have a video library that we're building of just expert interviews with people like yourself who have a specific area of expertise within this broader field of sexuality. Um, we have office hours where you're able to connect with me, able to connect with other members, just working through what does this look like in a small group setting, or what does it look like as we're reaching out to youth groups or from a pastoral setting. And so that platform is really designed more for Christian lay or vocational leaders who have a passion for this topic and feel like, hey, God is calling me to do even informal ministry on this topic, and I don't know where to start. Uh, so we're really excited about that and just to see people start to sign up for that and engage with us and engage with one another is just uh, hopefully just a vision of what the Lord has. Yeah. So in, in our last few minutes that we have here, I do want to, I want to set proper expectations for people that want to engage this process, because I think 
you and I both know that when you, when you really begin to understand and seek to apply God's design for our sexuality and, and place it within that larger context of the, the beautiful picture that God has given us of the intimacy between Christ and his church and that oneness and the covenant and all those kinds of things, I think we've recognized, as anybody will, man, there's some challenges, there's some obstacles, there's some things that are going to get in your way, not only of understanding that, but of applying that. So if, if you think about your own life or you think about even as people have, you've sought to disciple people through this process, what are some of the primary challenges that you've seen people face? Some things that have tripped them up, some things that have really confused them. What would you share with people so that they have some, some kind of proper expectations going in that it's not like, hey, if I just get my intention set in the right direction, it's all smooth sailing. Yeah, really good question. And I've definitely experienced this on my own journey. I think most of us, if you're resonating with this conversation, you feel like maybe you've gotten to a certain level of sexual wholeness where you're like, okay, I'm good. Like now I can start helping other people. But the way God works is he continually works on your heart as he equips and prepares you to help other people. Um, really, discipleship is the overflow of one life onto another. Mm. And so uh, you cannot disciple anyone further than God has taken you. And one of the biggest, I think, that trip ups that people get, and it's like, whoa, I didn't expect that, was um, what God may do first and foremost is to reveal in your own heart, like pieces of this that you've never understood, pieces of this within your walk with the Lord, within your marriage that you're like, wow, there's a lot of unnamed brokenness that we've been walking around with. I think first, maybe we need to look at that. And I need to invite the Lord to do some healing in my heart. And then out of that will come new life and ministry. So I think that's part of it. People are always looking for that quick fix. Give me the five steps to this or seven steps to this. There's Jesus never did that. Discipleship is messy. It's a lifelong journey. It has a definite direction and source of truth, but there's no set process. And so a lot of it is trusting the work of the Holy Spirit to use the word of God, to use the body of Christ to just shepherd you as you shepherd other people. And that includes in our parenting. There's no easy, if you just do this and this and this, it's all going to turn out great. Um, we live in a messy world with a spiritual battle always going on around us. And the more we can ha get at peace with that concept and just rely on the leading of the Holy Spirit, uh, he does direct us, but it doesn't look like a simple plan. So those might be some expectations. Yeah, I was listening to somebody recently that was talking about how um, uh, we have made the mistake in the church of, of again, thinking that discipleship is about knowledge mm -hmm. of information, when actually discipleship is about um, understanding where your attachments are. And mm -hmm. it gets back to that heart issue, right? Yeah. So if I'm actually a, a, a growing in my discipleship, then there is a greater sense of affection and attachment to God and his ways than simply um, I'm checking the box. Cause in other words, I think, I think what we've been describing here is when we have that behavior modification and that's, that's one of the challenges that I see so many people run into is like, no, stop telling me about my heart. Stop telling me about, you know, these underlying truths. I just want to know, tell me what to do. Give me the list of seven things. And, and I think one of the things that we need to do as leaders and encourage other leaders to do is, no, keep beating the drum of the heart because it's yeah. really, you know, it's the wellspring of life. It's out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, it's the heart that where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. There's this sense of it always comes back to the heart. And, and I think um, we, if we get that out of whack, then we're constantly going to be frustrated on this on this journey. Uh, so I think a little bit of what I'm hearing you say is get a little more familiar and comfortable with the mess. Yes. Like that yeah. it's just not always going to be comfortable. It's not. And I don't think that's the message we want to hear. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, our message we want to hear is no, Julie, what I want to hear you say is if I go to sexualdiscipleship.com 
and I start diving into these resources, in six weeks, it's going to be all figured out and it's going to be smooth. So I, I wanted, before we ended the program, to make sure that there's a proper expectation set for people that we're on a lifelong journey here. Um, and the hope is that as we are on this journey, there are stages in which we are at a place where we have more to offer to somebody who may be just stepping on this journey, but none of us are ever done. So what yeah. final word of just encouragement would you have to our listeners out there for wherever they are on this journey of sexual discipleship? Yeah. Um, you know, even listening to you talk, Jonathan, when you said people don't want you to ask about the heart, they want the seven steps. I think the question that we ask ourselves is why, you know, why are we more drawn to, if you do this, do this, do this, do this, you're good, rather than what in some ways might even sound easier, just open your heart. Um, and it's because we've built so much fear and guardedness around our heart that we think God is going to take away something that's precious to us. And that's, that's a lie of the enemy. You know, Jesus doesn't come to take away. He, he comes to give life. And, um, and in order for us to experience the resurrection power of Jesus, we also need to experience a part of dying to that stubbornness mm -hmm. of self. And, um, you know, that's really the message of all of what we're saying. My three sons often tease me about my job, like talking about sex. They're like, that's a weird job. But one of the things that I tell them all the time is really, I don't talk about sex. I talk about the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, sex is just the conduit. It's, it's the symptom. It's the piece of our heart that hurts, that really is prompting us to ask the deeper questions about who is God who is he to me? What is forgiveness? What is grace? What is redemption? And so my word of encouragement would be that this is not about sexuality. It is about sexuality, but at the heart level, it's about the only thing that matters. Uh, the work of Jesus Christ, first in our own lives, and then how we evidence that work of Jesus to a watching and hurting world. Well, Julie, it's always just such a delight to have you on the program. I, I feel like you're my second big sister, you know, <laughs> so it's a joy to do ministry alongside of you. So thanks for your, uh, your words of encouragement today. Thank you for what you guys have been doing and building out these resources for sexual discipleship. And we'll be sure to, to point people to the sexualdiscipleship.com website. But just we appreciate you. Thank you for being here today. Well, thanks. I feel the same way about you and Be Broken. It's just great to have you as a brother ministry and co-labor. Yeah. Well, listeners, uh, definitely go to sexualdiscipleship.com to learn more about the resources that uh, Julie and her team have developed to help you um, deliver this great news to people wherever they are in their journey. Uh, we're glad that you've been with us. We look forward to seeing you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio program. So take care. Mm -hmm.